So we're now <laughs> broadcasting to all attendees. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, uh, on our first webinar. My name's Toby Fox. Uh, I'm the managing director at 3Fox, which is uh, the marketing agency for uh, councils. Um, we've been running since 2004, and we've been running about 30 events a year, bringing councils and the development community together. Um, obviously, that's a little difficult in current conditions. So this webinar is our response to COVID-19. And we'll be hosting webinars every week. Uh, next Thursday, we'll be speaking about the effects of COVID on the planning system in a discussion entitled Planning in Isolation. But today's topic is how can councils, uh, how can the property industry help council right now? Um, and it's inspired by a campaign called Do Some Good, which was organized by CBRE and Greystar, um, primarily um, working to the NHS to support the NHS. Um, and to explain uh, that program uh, and to talk about how it might um, be used by local authorities, uh, we've got a superb panel of speakers for you. I'm absolutely delighted uh, that they've all managed to join us. Uh, bravely combating the twin evils of coronavirus and colds and uh, IT, um, which uh, hasn't uh, been that easy uh, this morning. But all the problems are solved and we're all here for you. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panellists to introduce themselves in turn now and to take a moment or two to talk a little about how the crisis has affected uh, their work day to day. So uh, if uh, we can, can we start with Darren Rodwell, please? Thank you very much, Toby. Uh, obviously, Barker the Dagnum is a, a, a borough in the east of London, which has a lot of uh, social issues. Um, so our, our situation has been very much about trying to deliver uh, support to the most vulnerable. To give you an idea of that, in the last seven days, um, we have uh, spoken to over 7,000 individual uh, residents, vulnerable residents, uh, we set up something called BDCAD, which is giving assistance to those residents who are unable to leave the home, a bit like myself at the moment. Um, and uh, effectively, uh, we will continue to try to deliver uh, as much support as possible, uh, rather than people having to try and find uh, support in the wider uh, areas of, of the, uh, the community. One of the things we've been doing is a daily update of the situation uh, in Barking and Dagenham when it comes to the coronavirus, how many people have had it, how many people that, uh, have passed, unfortunately, um, and you know, just different support messages that we could get out there. And, and overall, the feedback has been really good from lots of uh, residents who are quite worried about their situation because they've lost everything. Uh, they're normally the lower paid uh, zero hour contract workers um, and what we've had to do as a council is literally change our operating model to 75% of our staff working from home giving support to those residents uh, directly and obviously at the same time try to work through what the government says on a daily basis as well because like the other speakers here we can all tell you government don't tell us before they tell the public what's going on what we have to do is try and make an assessment of what's the best way of dealing with a situation thank you very much indeed Dan. that's uh, councillor darren robwell leader at barking and dagenham council um uh, councillor steve curran leader of hounslow council um if if you could uh, uh sort of follow on from darren there and also perhaps talk a little bit, bit about how these changes have affected the um the work that you were doing before that your normal sort of routines yeah, hi everyone. Um, it's, um, it's been an eye-opener actually. We've all talked about working from home and smart working as we call it in my organisation. I mean, we're, we're reasonably fortunate that um, we moved to our new headquarters a year ago and as part of that work we uh, had to be more agile uh, with our workforce so we can't have all of our staff working in the office on the same day. So at the moment we've got about 2,000 staff working remotely uh, and that's only because we have the IT system in place anyway so it's worked reasonably well. Um, I think that some of the, as Darren's mentioned the challenges about meeting those vulnerable groups, information pouring in from central government all of the time requesting 
feedback on what's going on. That's quite difficult. Uh, our staff are obviously very concerned about testing and we're very concerned about care workers in care homes uh, and PPE. So all that's been running on for some time and that's been covered extensively in the press. Uh, so we're trying to do as much as business as usual. So we've shut our libraries, like most people, we've shut our leisure centres uh, and playgrounds, etc. Uh, and there now has been a good response in our community. At first, it wasn't, I think, like the rest of the country, compliance wasn't as good as it should be. It's very good at the moment, and I think that's reflected across London. Uh, so new new ways of working, they're, they're going okay. Um, I think... Uh, uh, and people mention this, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. What happens in two or three weeks, because everyone's working at full tilt at the moment, I'm very concerned about people's capacity to deal with some of the, the stress levels they're under. And that's from the chief exec all the way down to the guys who are picking up our recycling and waste. So everyone's under a lot of pressure. So the mindset's changed. It's, it, it is about making sure we've got the best possible outcomes for our most vulnerable residents. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, Councillor Peter John of Southwark Council, uh, and also in your role at, uh, as, as Chair of London Councils, um, is, that, is that a common scene across the city? Is, is your experience of your, your colleagues the same across London? Uh, absolutely, Toby. Um, I mean, what we're seeing is councils now moving to critical services, uh, effectively. So, uh, in an average uh, on an average day, a council will be performing between two and three hundred functions. Um, you know, some of those that you'll be aware of, some that you won't be aware of. Um, but we're going to be moving to something like twenty to thirty services uh, in general across every council in London over the next week or so. Uh, and the reason why we're doing that is because, you know, as as Darren and Steve have said. We're having to concentrate our efforts, looking after the most vulnerable, um, doing things, again, that we have not done before, setting up massive community hubs, um, uh, you know, for all of our uh, boroughs. Um, and so rather than work felt uh, full pelt in every service and then fall over at some point over the next few weeks, we've got to draw back so that we build some slack into our respective systems. And so that we can also, quite honestly, uh, offer each other a bit of mutual aid and support if that is necessary as well in the coming weeks. So this is a real change in work and, and uh, you know, it, it, it's hitting us all. This morning I heard about the third Southwark employee who has died from COVID-19, somebody that anyone who came into the building would have had some contact with uh, over the last few years. So this is really hitting home. This is taking a massive um, physical and mental toll on staff and it's really upsetting people. Uh, sadly, it's not gonna be the last uh, uh, that uh, we hear, I'm sure, not just in Southwark, but across London. Yeah, that's terrible news and, and, and sympathies to, to, to you and your colleagues. Um, James, uh, if, if you'd uh, um, unmute yourself and, and talk a little from the private sector point of view as a senior director at, at Greystar, um, how has the crisis uh, affected the sort of development community? Uh, well, it is, it is tough. I mean, I think the, the, the slight, conf well, slight, uh, the confusion over uh, guidance in, in terms of construction has certainly affected our active uh, development sites. Um, they, with, with one exception, where some minor work is still carrying on, um, have all closed down, but that's been... Uh, the choice of the you know, principal contractor in the main uh, with with our support um, uh, and but it is it's it's seemed to me quite strange that uh, there hasn't been clearer distinction drawn between uh, you know, essential construction related work and you know, no one would no one would object for example to people working on the new you know, on, on making the making the, the temporary hospital at Excel for example and all or, or, or safety uh, and health critical work, um, either in people's homes or on other buildings. Um, but routine construction, it did, does seem uh, pretty strange that that is carrying on, both from you know, the, 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 the social distancing measures that are able to be taken uh, of on site, uh, but also, um, uh, but also you know, the public transport and, and, and you know, 
for people to get to the sites in the first place. I suppose, in a way, London is probably different from a lot of the rest of the country in the sense that most sites in London would not have a contractor's car park, for example. Everyone is coming by public transport, by and large, to get to the site. Uh, and it does seem um, uh, it does seem strange that that distinction wasn't drawn a bit more more, more carefully. I think I think discussions are still going on on that, but it's not helped anyone that that's not been clearer sooner. Um, uh, and in terms of our own uh, activities, yes, as I say, our, our sites are pretty much closed down now. Uh, you know, that wasn't a, you know, it wasn't something that we could do instantly, but it was it was done mainly over the course of last week, and by the end of last week. Um, uh, that those were, were those were shut down. Uh, obviously, we've got active uh, operational buildings with uh, both in the build to rent and the student housing sector. We've got teams on site that are obviously taking uh, taking their own precautions in operational occupied buildings. Uh, uh, but in terms of our sort of corporate office, um, we uh, went pretty quickly from uh, a, a recommendation to work from home. Uh, which was, I think, just before the advice to avoid going to pubs and restaurants, uh, which was probably nearly three weeks ago now, um, uh, and then just before the, you know, the, the further advice to close those sort of facilities down came, we we took the decision that to close the office altogether, um, and that's been the case for over two weeks now. So, um, uh, so that uh, uh, I suppose the fortunate thing that is we introduced a new software to be able to video conference more easily between us all and I think that has been something of a, a godsend uh, for a lot of people it's, it's much it's, you, know, if, you know when you can see who you're talking to it's, it's always a lot better than just being on a, on a standard phone call and that's um, particularly for people who are isolating or kind of living on their own I think that's that's been a big help um, uh, to just have that sort of a bit, bit of extra, even though it's virtual, the human contact, and that helps uh, helps things along a bit. But in terms of what we're aiming to do, I think that you know, the, yeah, our, our program, our ambition remain the same, and we are still looking for uh, additional opportunities into the future. Uh, but we are just working on those in a slightly different way than obviously we, if we were all in the office and everyone else was in their offices as well. Okay, thanks very much, James. Thanks everyone for, for that summary. Um, before we get into the sort of the meat of the, the discussion now, um, we're uh, delighted to say that there's, there's over 100 people now in, in the audience. We've got about 107 people, I think, uh, watching. Um, so just a, a couple of notes to, to the audience. Um, firstly, um, if you'd like to address the, the panelists after we've um, had a, a short discussion now, there's a Q&A um, option on this platform. So please do uh, send us your questions. Um, secondly, there is a polling system. So I'll be flipping up a, a poll onto the screen every so often. And they're just yes and no answers. Um, but if you could uh, fill them in, then that'll really help fuel the discussion. Um, and we've got a survey at the end. So when you exit from the webinar, there's a, a short survey. But it'll take a few seconds. Really to do it. But that'll give us some material to produce a small report at the end of this, which will help us raise the profile of, of the Do Some Good campaign. Um, so those are the, the, the sort of notes to, to the audience. Um, James, I, I guess it's not true to say um, you've now got a lot of time on your hands because as you said, the acquisitions program goes on, um, you've got a large business to, to, to still manage. But to a certain extent, uh, your focus has been diverted into um, charitable work, into the Do Some Good campaign. Um, could you talk us through a little bit what that what that campaign is and, and how it works before we start talking to the the councils about how they might engage with it? Uh, yes, of course, uh, Toby. It's, it's been um, quite an exciting uh, uh, thing to be involved with, and it really um, uh, was was driven by a, a couple of colleagues in my my office, uh, Adina David and Kyle McFadden, uh, along with uh, Deborah Udolf at Say uh, Consulting. Um, and Andrew at Devil, Devil Smith. Um, we, what we were trying to do is link up with um, you know, a, a campaign that had been initiated by the CBRE in terms of looking for a spare space for NHS. But what we did was really repurpose uh, the Do Some Good um, website, um, which was, uh, I think, um, brought about um, because of the first postponement of MIPIM, actually, it was when that week became clear for a lot of people, um, and that was Deborah Udolf at Say who who created that and, and and said, well, let's 
use some of the spare time that we now have in this week to do some something good and i think a lot of people did some some good charitable work during that particular week and now we've kind of repurposed that website and brought it into to uh you know recognizing really that real estate is uh, and always has been a sort of really people-based business and it's you know good real estate is always concerned about the community uh, and, the, and the places that we are helping uh, through through uh, development of whether that's residential uh, commercial or, or, or other community infrastructure buildings of any sort um, uh, so and clearly we've got a we've got a health crisis on so the obvious uh, thing was to, to try and link in with this campaign for the nhs and it's really looking for is appealing for offers of uh, in three really main areas what one is providing space uh, and that's probably the one that grabs the biggest headlines uh, obviously and that's really to respond to uh, frontline health uh, care workers who uh, need accommodation separate from their regular household for for whatever reason, and that may be because there's a there's a self isolation issue within the household. Um, it may be because there's a there's a transport issue in getting to work and and and, and in getting the, uh, the in alternative accommodation closer to their place of work, um, and the and the sort of NHS criteria is really within a 15 minute walk of you know the hospital or other place where they're working. Um, uh, or some awesome car parking that's that's you know within a 15 minute walk so that enhances the capacity of of existing car parking spaces if if that's the mode of transport that people need to use um, the, the second area is in sourcing uh, medical supplies uh, you know PPE is, is in the headlines quite rightly um, uh, as, you know and, and conscious that you know, the construction industry does have a uh, does have a uh, obviously a use of PPE in its work as well, and there is some spare stock of that that may be around on various sites, and it's really trying to get that. So yes, if you put the, the slides up, uh, yeah, so just to let everyone know where the where the um, yeah that first slide is really the uh, the, the do some good website, um, and it's really about uniting the, you know the property industry uh, over this to to uh, to to do that. So if you if you go on to the next slide, slide Toby, that's the the, the main uh, the main website where we sort of set it out and it seems like ages ago it's only last week that really, that really this got launched um, uh, but uh, we'll flip through these fairly quickly because they're, they're just screenshots rather than the live website um, but then we've set up a LinkedIn uh, site for this as well uh, and we're all trying to spread spread the word as, as much as we can and this uh, webinar is hopefully part of that um, uh, and it will be very very useful in that um, uh, and the, and the, yeah, that's the CBRE website, uh, which is really focused on the uh, the space. So there's a lot of, yeah, as I understand it, there's a huge quantity of offers coming into um, this this website through ours and through the CBRE's website direct. Uh, in terms of then filtering that. Um, the, and we've tried to trying to link up to avoid duplication we're trying to link up with with allied campaigns and this is another one nhs homes which i believe is a is a um a group of uh service department providers who are uh, looking at uh you know empty stock which they can maybe repurpose on a temporary basis for these for these types of uses uh 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 the construct the contractors uh, have got together on this uh PPE uh, uh, campaign called uh, National Equipment Appeal Database. Uh, so a lot of the PPE stuff is going through there, but again, we're coordinating with that. Uh, and I think the final one I was just going to draw attention to here is uh, yeah, Globe Chain, which is also uh, concerned with the PPE. Um, and maybe just go back to the, the first slide as just a holding holding slide there. Um, uh, so there is there is a, a huge amount going on a lot of people involved there's a lot of offers coming in those are uh, this week is probably uh, a lot of work going on in terms of collating filtering prioritizing some of those things but because some of uh, and i suppose this is where it comes into the wider conversation with local authorities because uh, some of the offers that are coming in probably may not um, uh, suit the nhs criteria in terms of being within a 15 minute walk of you know, major hospitals or healthcare facilities um, there may be an opportunity to 
to overflow the excess uh, into other uh, uh, other uh, need to satisfy other needs to address other needs, uh, and uh, so that. You know, so the third area is also in the operational support um, and logistics and facilities management, which you know, we've got a lot of uh, expertise across the, the property sector to add into that. So that's kind of a, a little uh, sort of overview of, of where we're coming from. Uh, I say I haven't got hard numbers at the moment, but other than to say that the feedback I'm getting is that there is, I mean, a, I've heard some very approximate numbers, which I won't share because they're not really verified, but they are astonishingly large in the number of offers that are coming in, which is really heartening to see that people are, are, are you know, hearing about this, feeling that, that, that this, is, this is a really good use of spare space and spare resources. Uh, and we're all trying to do our bit uh, to, to help both the NHS and, and also the wider community. So that's probably uh, the launch pad for the, for the, for the discussion we can uh, we can uh, we can do. I mean, in addition to all that, we are also adding in some charity fundraising as well. Uh, and there are, you know, if you go into these websites, particularly the Do Some Good one, you'll find some links uh, in in that as well uh, for people who can't actually offer anything uh, directly material, but still want to contribute to the campaign. Uh, and that's that's uh, another another sort of facet to this. Right. Thank you very much indeed, James. That's, it's fantastic work. I think um, we we. <coughs> Ordered the NHS um, for, for a substantial amount of time last week and I, I, I believe that uh, this evening we're going to be asked to applaud the other key workers who are also uh, keeping us all alive and safe and, and well fed and of course among them and, and, and rarely mentioned actually I think is um, local authority staff who, who are responding absolutely magnificently to, to some of the challenges that are being put, put before them at the moment and if there, is, um, if there is excess capacity in the Do Some Good campaign, and that can be directed towards uh, helping local authority efforts, then, then that's definitely to be, to be applauded. Um, if I could turn to, to Darren Rodwell at Barking Dagenham first. Um, Darren, having heard a little about the, the Do Some Good campaign and some of the resources that are available, can you think of some ways in which the property industry might be able to help your, your efforts? I think, uh, to be honest, at this moment in time, it's good to know that those uh, there's companies out there that want to try and support the efforts of what local authority is doing. Um, as it stands at the moment, and I was having this discussion with someone earlier today, uh, we've not relied on things like hotels and other such institutions because we couldn't. So we've relied on our what would be our go-to partners, which are normally the faith and voluntary sector because we've worked with them over many years over many projects on on many issues so we've found that actually with 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 uh we're, we're still learning I'm, I'm still learning my officers are still learning about what genuine support is there from the private sector that will help us deliver uh more more support i mean it's it's quite interesting uh one of the biggest problems we've got is communication. Uh, just whilst uh, we've been on uh, today, I've got a resident ranting at me, her 88 year old mum is not being looked after. Uh, she's in her 60s herself. And all we want to do is look after council tenants. And it's, you know, trying to get that message out there that a local authority does more than just look after a council tenant. A local authority does more than, uh, you know, look, I clap for the NHS. I, I'm, I'm pleased it saved my life and many of my family's members' lives. Um, but local authorities are the glue that combine every part of society together. And I think, if anything, I hope people will realise how important local government is. And, but we can't do it alone. And to have the, uh, you know, a programme like this that is coming forward that says, look, we do have some offer of help here. But remember, this is only two weeks in. We've got this is this is a marathon, not a sprint. So I, I, you know, with a bit more dialogue about what offers are there and where it could be used uh, to help support a much longer program. I think that's the conversation that really has to start now, because at the moment we're still just trying to play catch up with what government wants us to do. And it's not always not always um, most helpful either. Particularly, I think closing down all the, all the hotels straight away um, might, <laughs> might undermine 
uh, efforts to uh, to keep people isolated and safe. Um, uh, Peter, um, ha have you got any thoughts on on the Do Some Good campaign and, and how you might engage with it, uh, both in Southwark and, and across across London through London councils? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it sounds fantastic, um, Toby and James. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, Darren's kind of touched on some of it. But I mean, there are some there are some simple asks that we have, and I think they're kind of in 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 what you've uh, talked about, James. But you know, if you've got any completed properties that are available for occupation, uh, even though they might not have been completely signed off yet, please make them available to um, you know council staff or to the, to your local council. We've got instances where you know we have got families in shared facilities, and we need to separate them in order to you know ensure that there's no uh, uh, cross contamination, I guess, I'd, uh, for want of a better word. Have you got any em empty office space that could be converted to residential use for the period of this crisis? We've also got, you know, families who are just generally overcrowded. We're expecting to see, aren't we, a real rise in the number of domestic violence cases uh, during this period, whilst families are confined uh, in overcrowded conditions. So anything that can help that would be good. Um, you talked about uh, effectively mutual aid, PPE. Uh, anything that is is going spare would be welcomed by uh, local authorities. Um, quite rightly, the concentration is always on the NHS at times of crisis like this. Um, but, you know, if we haven't got social care workers and home care workers with PPE, then we're not going to be able to get people out of hospitals to get other people into hospitals. So it's really critical that, you know, PPE does come to local authorities. Uh, have you got repair teams who could help us? At the moment, we're only able to undertake emergency repairs. Is there anything that we can do together uh, on that front? And I think also the big thing, I think, Toby, is let's think about the future. What does a post-COVID-19 London look like? Um, you know, the recovery phase for this is going to be long and it's going to be incredibly challenging. And I think we all need to be thinking about what that looks like sooner rather than later, because we all get through this. Um, but, you know, what will be the appetite for investment? I hope that the appetite for investment in our city remains strong. Um, uh, and while some people might think I don't want to live in London anymore after this experience, there'll be lots of people who still want to make London their home. Um, so, you know, I, I think the future still will be vibrant, but we're going to need to work together to make that so. Um, but that mutual aid and th those kind of how we can support each other through, you know, uh, accommodation uh, and through PPE and through knowledge and know-how, I think they'll be critical. Great stuff. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I'll, um, I'll pick up on the, the sort of recovery um, question shortly, because I'd like to get into that in, in more detail. And also a lot of the questions that are coming through from the, art, from the audience are, are, are focused on, on sort of looking forward beyond, beyond the crisis. But before we go on to that, um, I'll just pick up with, with Steve. Is there anything else that, that you'd like to sort of respond to, to James with in terms of what the property industry might offer and what you've heard about yeah. and good? Okay, I'd just like to thank James and his team and the other participants in putting the scheme together. I think it really shows about close relationships with, which local authorities have with, with developers, with contractors. We've got a very strong relationship in, in Hounslow. Uh, and the week before last, we had um, some of our major developers were closing down their sites and they were offering us their PPE straight away. We didn't even have to ask. So we're very grateful for that. Um, I think going forward, uh, Peter's picked up about how, what's the relationship going to be uh, after the crisis is over. And I think it will be a stronger one, actually. Uh, uh, I'm sure it will, because one of the things that's worrying me now is about jobs and incomes. And I'll juxtaposition at Hounslow to Heathrow. We're, and if we, we're probably going to hear that British Airways is going to uh, suspend all of its staff today. So there's going to be a, a massive economic fallout for our residents in, in, in Hounslow. Uh, how we work through that, I'm very worried about, if you look at the construction sites, how many of those workers have now gone home, especially if they're from uh, the rest of Europe, will they come back? So there's some real difficult challenges for us to go forward. But we've still got to build uh, new, new homes, uh, new council homes, new private homes. Peter's picked up on overcrowding. That, this period through the crisis will emphasise the overcrowding problem even more. So 
I think it, it's a fantastic start, and I'm, I'm looking forward to a stronger relationship with the with the uh, development industry and contractors. Great, it was nice to hear positive positive speaking at, at a time like this. I, someone mentioned to me the um, the other day that um, there's a question over whether during during this crisis the population of London might actually be decreasing. There are so many uh, construction workers, for example, but workers of all kinds returning to their homes and not just outside the UK there are lots of people moving back to um, north of England the southwest of England from from London um, to, to be with their families uh, during during the lockdown um, but just returning to the, the sort of the, the, the prime theme um, the main session um, James have you heard anything uh, in in what our, our three guests have said that um, that you can pick up on that, that you can respond to uh, yes, indeed, I have. I mean, I, I think we, we do have. Um, we have had, as I say, we've had a huge number of, of offers of, of uh, across all of those three uh, areas, uh, and some of them definitely would be appropriate. Uh, we know of some of the property, for example, which is definitely does not meet the NHS criteria, so therefore is available for other uses. Um, I think, um, and again, on the PPE side, I think one thing I didn't mention before was um, an initiative we're trying to link up with. A whole range of people who have uh, 3D printing capability to produce, um, you know, particularly the sort of visors and that sort of thing. Um, in addition to you know the supplies that are obviously struggling to get through to the front line as it is. So, um, uh, I think that what would really help us, and and we can you know take, we can discuss how this might work, is is really to have a very clear, uh, you know connection to link into. Um, uh, it's going to be, I mean, there's a lot of people involved already. The communications are already quite complicated, as you can imagine. Um, and having sort of to reproduce that with every single borough might might be, uh, you know, approaching overload. I'm, Peter, I was wondering whether, the, you know, the London councils might, might be a sort of a, a natural hub for that to then uh, to be a sort of central point of contact and then could distribute offers out rather than trying to sort of um, you know, deal with each borough individually. I don't know what you think about that. We, we could do our best at the moment, uh, before I've got a name to give you uh, at London Councils, I think probably the best thing to do is to uh, contact your usual contacts at, uh, you, the, uh, across the boroughs. I know Steve Platts was trying to make some calls out yesterday to uh, the development world who work in, in Southwark and there'll be people like Steve in every borough who um, sadly because of the current circumstances are not doing their usual day job as, as much as usual so you know make contact with your usual contacts in the boroughs um, and then we can think about how we coordinate that uh, at a London Council at this level and if I can get you a name and a number at London Councils in due course I certainly will. Yes, I wasn't expecting a ready-made answer there, but uh, it was just, you know, just trying to you know, get, get... It's going to go on my going list on. of actions. Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> in the interim, uh, James, if, if, if anybody um, in your network or anybody out there is trying to make contact with Council for, for whatever reason you can't, um, we're very happy to, to liaise and help channel um, inquiries through to London Councils and, and to the boroughs. So feel free to contact um, Free Fox with, with any inquiries. In yeah, that's great, Toby. Thank you. We're happy to do our bit for, for yeah. you know, try and do some good our, ourselves. Um, I'm fascinated to hear about the, the sort of the idea of using 3D printing uh, techniques as well to, to, to produce PPE directly. I mean, it, it leads me to wonder like, if, if we're falling back on architects and model makers uh, to produce PPP, PPE equipment for, for um, key workers. It does sort of beg the question a bit about uh, what was the plan uh, and um, and how was how were we prepared nationally for for this crisis? So I'm just going to sort of move into the Q and A um, part of, of this meeting. The top question at the moment, one of the top questions at the moment, is what what more could we ask for from government um, to to help in your in your efforts at this time and and also you know to support the the work of, of do some good. So, um, Steve, what, what, what would your ask from, from government be in the immediate term and then also in the longer term uh, when we come to, to recovery and emerging from the crisis? Um, I think the, um, and we've seen from, and I'm not um, pointing fingers here, it's just a fact, isn't it? We have a, we've had a debacle over PPE and now testing. It's, and Darren picked up on it earlier. If, you know, if government are going to make some announcements, can they please talk to us first? before they make an announcement so we can then put things in place or understand what the ask is 
so we could deliver it because people hear it on the radio, the TV, uh, or on the web, whatever, and they expect it to be there the next day or the same day. So there's enormous pressure on us, certainly from business now, who want their uh, grants, et cetera, et cetera, quite rightly. Business rates, another big problem. So uh, from government, it's keep up the pace, and we, we're very comfortable working at pace, uh, but it's given us a little bit of time so we can put things in place to, to, to deal with the requests or the demands that are put upon us. Thanks, Steve. Um, I've just launched the, the first of the polls to ask the audience whether the private sector is, is doing enough to support local authorities at this time. But um, staying with the theme of, uh, of government for now for our panel, Darren, um, what, what would your ask of government be? I, I know that you, you're very reticent about, uh, about asking government for anything, but uh, what would it be at this time? Uh, no, I mean, to be honest, understanding what's the situation on the ground. I mean, I've watched some of the government briefings and they resemble nothing to what is happening in my local community. So when uh, they were talking about there wasn't uh, uh, shop supply issues, well, there certainly was in Barker and Dagnum, uh, and I understand it from speaking to other leaders that there was problems there too. Um, you know, it was one of those, one of the questions, we, we asked the minister was, could local authority have a direct line in to the supermarkets to get supplies? Because actually, if we're going to the same places that the general public were going to try to help the most vulnerable, it makes the job three or four times as hard, you know? Um, so my, my, big, my big problem is government's got to listen to local government because in these times of, um, well, in these times that are unprecedented you know it's local government that comes to the fore that shows its true worth despite all of the um you know funding cuts that have been placed upon local government local government is still the bit of government that actually connects the citizen to the wider network of support and uh, and i think you know talking to uh, uh colleagues up and down the country uh it's clear that if it wasn't for local government there'll be a much worse situation out there um uh especially when it comes to you know people controlling the messaging about everyone having to be part of a society a community and a, you know showing a, a respect for one another's values yeah absolutely uh, peter would you like to, to comment on that no, I think uh, that's that's absolutely right. I mean, I think that there have been problems and we're, we're kind of trying to iron them out in terms of governing London is really difficult and it's really complicated um, because you have various tiers. And at the moment, the tier that is missing at the top table, and I know this has frustrated me and it's frustrated colleagues, has been local government um, and local government political leadership. Um, the GLA and the mayor have been in there. Um, some of our chief executives have been involved in there, but actually, you know, us as the voice of the political leadership has not been there. I'm hoping we're going to make some progress on that today, and, and I'll be able to tell colleagues about some, some good news, which I think puts us um, uh, much more in the heart of things, which I think would be good news for us all. In terms of kind of a, a more general ask of government, I suppose it would be, and this is slightly looking to the future, but please regard everything that you're doing now as quite exceptional and let's not that we had and because London was working so well and I think our plans for the future were so great and so exciting let's not derail that completely um, you know I know this is going to take a lot of time and money to pay back the debts that we're incurring at this time uh, but let's not do that at the expense of you know, all of the other positive programs that we had for the future. I think that would be my plea to government at the moment. Let's try and get back to properly business as usual as quickly as we possibly can. That's slightly optimistic, I guess, but it's, it's, it's really critical. Indeed, absolutely. And what about from the private sector's point of view, James? I mean, what's, what's your, your sort of response to, to the government's actions so far and, and what, what's your ask of them going forward? Um, well, I, I, uh... Yes, and I probably what I, what I said before about sort of a bit more clarity on on you know, on construction, and I think that is 
from what I'm hearing and reading, it's it's probably on its way that they're, they're going to have to sort of subcategorize construction into essential and, and, and non-essential um, through some sort of definition, or at least provide some more guidance to allow people to, um, uh, because there are some there are some some sort of uh, bad stories out there in terms of uh, people feeling either pressured to carry on going to construction sites to work uh, and not not being sure either because they're self-employed or they don't fit into one of the schemes that's been announced uh, so far um, and, and then from pressure being put on them um, you know having to choose really between sort of income and health of their families which is uh, a, you know an unacceptable position to be in in my opinion um, uh, I, I I think the thing, another thing I hadn't mentioned so far in this is we have, um, you know, obviously the NHS has been our prime con consideration. You know, local authorities are uh, obviously allied. Uh, all these things overlap, but also the other, the other part of that jigsaw. And we have had some conversations with officials from uh, MHCLG um, talking about, you know, housing homeless, which I know they've been talking to all the local authorities about as well. Uh, but also issues about uh, you know, the, you know the, the, the families who are families or households which are under stress because of uh, perhaps domestic abuse or violence uh, or a whole range of other uh, issues. So um, there are connections being made. They can all get better. They can all get more efficient, and, and uh, we would like to to see that uh, carrying on. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. And and uh, another sort of. Um aspect of this is and, and what you've all sort of referred to is is about uh, is about looking beyond the, the the current crisis and one of the one of the interesting questions that's come up from the audience on on that um front is about how much time you have to actually think about the future so can, can you sort of estimate what what sort of uh what sort of chunk of your of your day can you actually afford to spend thinking beyond the next two weeks the next three weeks uh, James, would you like to, to kick us off? Uh, I, I, I like to think I was thinking about the future quite a lot, so it's probably about 90%. Um, but, uh, you know, seriously, I, I mean, I, I think, and I suppose, um, you know, stepping back a bit, you know, from a, from a you know, Grace are obviously a, a leading part of Build to Rent, and Build to Rent is, is something that has been looking to the future you know, for the five, five plus years that it's been evolving for already uh, but we very much recognize it's a new type of uh, housing so we've all been always been looking at sort of future trends and whether that's demographics or or demands and the way people live the way that communities are formed the way that we can help uh, in, in managing those uh, uh, so I think um, that is good I, I tend to agree with previous comments I think you know I mean we had this same discussions last year in the, in the sort of uh, with, you know the, the, the Brexit word, which we haven't really heard a lot of recently. But you know what was going to happen to London? You know, London is is a, an amazing city. Uh, it is not going to stop being a world global city. Um, it's always going to be attractive to people to come to from whether they're from within the UK or from outside. Um, and they and you know, we will continue to welcome them all. Um, I'm sure. But uh, but the way that that changes the way that I think the biggest change may be actually on on you know the way people actually work. Um, I think the, the these last couple of weeks and the next few weeks will show how just how much can be done remotely. Um, uh, Steve, I think you mentioned you, you you've gone to offices. I think probably a lot of us are now in the office, you know, office spaces where if everybody did turn up on the same day, you'd really struggle to accommodate them. Or maybe it's even calculated that you you cannot possibly do that. I mean, I you know when I worked at previous places, you know, the busiest day in the office was usually the day of the Christmas party when everyone did actually turn up, um, and it was you, know, you had to get get there really early to get a desk for the day. Um, but you know that's that's a sort of trivial example that illustrates the point. That, that I think you know agile working will become uh, a bigger feature into the future. But what does that mean, both for workplaces, but also for uh, places that people live? Um, uh, and in, and you know, and what are the consequences of that in terms of you know social uh, isolation and and people's sort of uh, mental well-being as well as their physical well-being? It's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, in, in, indeed. And and one one of the things that's been put to me uh, recently is the question. And it, it took me aback a bit, but it was it was the question of whether things actually will change that much. And 
Um, I, I think it was suggested that after the Great Fire of London, um, there was lots of talk about London being rebuilt mm -hmm. in a completely different way, um, it, much more functional and, and, and much more um, uh, well designed. Uh, but actually, the reality was that um, everyone went back to building things pretty much as they had done had done before. And and perhaps this is this is going to be the same. Do do you have a sense of that, Darren, in in Buckingham Dagnan, that um, that that we've really turned a corner and everything will be different, uh, or or do you feel that that things will be going back uh, to much the same way they were before? Um, I think it's too early to say. Um, I mean, we're only, as I say, second week into at least the twelve week period of change. Um, I think we don't want to be too downbeat on what we're doing, actually. I mean, uh, as Steve said earlier and Peter said earlier, you know, we're organisations of 3,000 odd staff each. That's averagely what you'll get across London's councils. You know, they, that's people that have literally gone from being in an office environment to being able to, uh, you know, work from home and still deliver pretty much what is being expected of them uh in a in a in the way that's expected of them but i mean i i personally people like to interact so the idea of everyone sort of sitting in um rooms like we are now and then talking this way okay it's quite no novel for a while but you know what um you know talking to the staff and, and, and uh give it you know, listening to what they're saying to us at the moment is a lot of that is they can't wait to be able to do proper interaction again, you know. And uh, but I, I think we should we should really take our hats off to uh, London being able to literally flick a switch and still operate in a way that actually, you know, not being funny, but I had a meeting earlier today about planning and you know, all of that, you know, we're going to go to virtual meetings, we, we, we're going to make sure that, you know, whatever we can do to, to carry on the process of business to do with uh, local government is still happening. And it's happening in a way that, you know, some people would have been very shocked if it hadn't have happened. As I say, it could be a much dire space in our communities right now, but the bins are still being collected. The vulnerable are still being looked after. You know, and, and we are still operating uh, in a way that isn't natural to us, but certainly isn't as alien as some might try and make it out to be. You know, we are a very, very robust part of the government family. And, uh, and, I th and that's where I think, you know, look, I, I, all of our blue light services are, are fantastic and we should applaud them at any given time. But you know what? Um, the glue, as I said earlier, that holds it together is local government, because it's always local government that has to pick up the pieces after the initial uh, incident. And it's local government that will always deliver the wider uh, delivery programme over a much longer period. So I, I, I think hats off to our staff. For, for literally being able to be that versatile while still trying to work with all the sectors we have to and uh, give it out cub that we have to which is to support you know everyone in our communities yeah no, I, I hear you fair, fair point um peter a, a lot of this um conversation all of this conversation so far has been very london centric um but obviously mm -hmm. this is a this is a global crisis never mind a national crisis um and do some good is a is a national campaign what interaction I, I, I apologise in advance for dumping everything on London councils. Um, you know, it's not a it's not an enormous secretariat, and, and you don't have all the resources in the world. But um, but it is the the body that represents all of London's local authorities. So, what work is London London councils doing, if any, to to interact beyond London with with local authorities um, across the, the country? And and how different or similar is the picture outside London? Well, I mean, it's an incredibly similar picture. Uh, I mean, London is is you know, it's recognised we're a couple of weeks ahead of the rest of the country in terms of the impact of uh, the coronavirus. Um, but the picture in terms of preparedness um, and local authorities working is, is similar. Um, I'm, I'm having conversations with, as, as I'm sure Steve and Darren are and others, with colleagues outside London, um, checking in on them, how are they doing, you know, what's the situation where they are. 
Um, and I suppose it comes back to the, the point I was making about, um, you know, the future and government not being diverted from the plans that we had beforehand. I think it's really critical and it, it applies to outside London for local government and developers as much as it does inside London. I'm really concerned, for instance, um, that because of the massive spending the government is undertaking as part of the response to the coronavirus, that we will lose some of the big infrastructure projects. Something mm. dear to my heart, the Bakerloo Line extension, you wouldn't expect me not to mention it. Um, you know, we cannot afford to lose that for London, is my view. But outside London, you know, similarly, um, you know, with HS2 and, you know, the different branches of HS2, we, sh we shouldn't see a slowing down. Let's get back to that investment, that capital investment, to make our country work, you know, better again in the future. Yes, there'll be things that we need to do as a res result of the coronavirus, but let's not lose that sense of ambition. And I think that's mm. a, a, a kind of a, a thought that applies as much outside London as it does in London. You know, so that's where local government and the development world can, can really work together for recovery uh, after this is over. James, have you, have you noticed um, any difference in conditions for, for your business um, in and outside London during the crisis? Um, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're <coughs> Greystar, Greystar is a, a global, uh, global business and um, clearly you know, the majority of our business is actually in the United States, which is a whole, whole different story again. And they are you know, maybe, arguably a couple of weeks or more behind uh, Europe. Um, uh, or, or certainly the UK, um, and the UK being a couple of weeks behind other places in Europe. So um, I, think, I think it's really just dawning on them, um, and the, the change of tone was pretty apparent yesterday um, uh, in, in realising the scale and the impact this is going to have uh, on them. Uh, I, it's, I mean, it's, it is interesting. We've 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 had a couple of uh, of these sort of calls between. Uh, between the, uh, the international offices we have, we have uh, around uh, around Europe, I think everyone is just going through the same cycle, just at slightly different times. Um, uh, I, I, to what whether it's just we just sort of hunker down and 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 then resume again once once things get lifted. Uh, I I think everyone hopes that that's the case, um, but whether there will be any other serious uh, longer term. Uh, the implications to what we're doing, uh, I'm not quite sure. It's probably too too early to say. I mean, you know, part of our, our business is, is sort of student housing, for example. There's a lot of um, uh, international uh, uh, aspect to that, and to what extent that changes for the future may be an interesting uh, interesting thing to to see. Uh, uh, you'd hope it wouldn't have much of an effect, but you know, I know that university funding is is you know is struggling uh, with the current restrictions. So there may be some, some implications for that. Um, so I think it's probably too early to say anything sort of concrete, but there are a lot of areas which are, are being monitored and uh, a lot of things to consider uh, going forward. Just before I, before I stop there, I think it was interesting to hear what Darren said, just going back on the previous thing um, about sort of the way of, way of working. Uh, something that occurred to me was actually a lot of, a lot of good ideas come out of workplaces because not because of uh, organized meetings but just being around people and overhearing conversations and joining you know water cooler or or coffee machine moments um uh, actually things and those that's that's the sort of thing that doesn't happen on this type of uh, sort of online environment when uh, home working uh, and so those sort of things yeah it, 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 it'd be quite easy to lose those if we're not careful uh, and we've got to sort of think of other of recreating perhaps yeah I, 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 wise words I, we've just said goodbye to to um councillor robwell who has got out of his sick bed to to join us and has finally succumbed so um many thanks darren for for giving us a uh, best part of an hour of, of your time um steve in, in terms of the sort of the recovery and the effect of, of of what's happened on on business and how that knocks on to the work of, of councils um, you, you mentioned British Airways earlier. They're, I'm told, laying off 18,000 people today. Um, clearly, changes like that are going to have a huge effect on your plans for new housing, for regeneration, for, for the local economy in, in Hounslow. How do you see uh, a borough like Hounslow emerging from, from the, the crisis? 
Um, I think it's going to be a, a tough environment, both for us and for, for developers and, and contractors. But as Peter said, we, we've got to press on. We can't afford to lose major housing projects or infrastructure, especially, um, as Peter said, HS2, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we've, there is a future. It seems a long way off. But people still need new, new homes. They still need a uh, buy to rent, uh, et cetera. Uh, there still will be a student population that will need accommodation. Uh, uh, and we have to plan for that. So we're all already talking about that. What does recovery look like in six months' time? How are we going to support uh, developers and contractors and, and industry? What's the longer term effects with Heathrow, particularly with the um, court judgment? What does that mean? So it's really important for us that uh, we keep that interest in Hounslow and that, we, that because of this, there isn't any stagnation. We have to go forward. We have to learn the mistakes from this and build a better, a better London for it. And I'm sure we, we can all do that. In, in the meantime, um, the sort of number one question on, on, on our audience's lips and on everyone I've spoken to for the last few weeks, uh, last few days, um, is, is regarding kind of current uh, operations and in particular the, the planning system. And we're going to um, focus on that in depth next week and, and talk about how councils are, are coping with uh, planning and, and adjusting their uh, planning system. But I, am I right in saying that the planning committee isn't meeting in, in Hounslow now? And if that's the case, what measures are you, are you taking to adjust to the, the, the new uh, circumstances and, and get planning moving and get, get regeneration going? Well, the, the final guide that only came out last week of, on, on planning. So we expect to have a normal planning committee in May. That, that there wasn't much on, on, on the agenda anyway in, in, in April. So um, we've decided to cancel that one, but we will be geared up. So we'll be holding our planning committee, our licensing committee in May as usual, and it will be business as usual. But virtually. Virtually, yeah. Yeah, and I know in, uh, in Barking and Dagman, because Be First is, is separate from the, um, from the council, that, um, that they're welcoming um, engagement at the moment um, because their staff haven't been switched over to um, emergency responsibilities. They're, they're still doing the job that, um, that they were doing before the crisis. But um, what about in Southwark and, and in other councils across London, Peter? What's your, um, your sort of picture of the, the, the planning scene? Uh, are, are, they, are they resourced um, to the same level that they were before the crisis or, or is some of that the sort of planning and development um, capacity being shifted into, into emergency responsibilities? Well, I know that some officers have been shifted, for instance, in Southwark from regeneration into res uh, emergency response. It is our hope to get our planning committee up and running again. Steve mentioned the, the regulations or the guidance last week. I think it's only just the regulations being published this morning. Um, that they're that new as quickly as we can. Reassuring anyone who's listening, uh, you know, I, I know that we've got a, a massive backlog in Southwark and you're very anxious and you're still anxious to get your applications heard and we'll do our best to get there uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so we will be, we'll be having virtual meetings soon. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, some staff have been moved around, but if we can keep things going and, and we know that things have got to get going in, 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 in uh, you know, planning, particularly the government is incredibly keen that we do for the future economy um, of the country that we do carry on having planning committees and the planning process doesn't stagnate over this period. We'll do our best to try and support that. Fantastic. And, 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 and James, presumably your call would be for that to take place. You're, you're, you're keen to continue doing business. You're keen to continue to pursue opportunities um, at, at Greystar. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think we, yeah, we, we are, um, I mean, Grace and I have been in the UK for six, seven years and, and uh, we are, you know, playing our part in, in addressing the housing um, supply crisis. And, you know, it, it, you know, people do talk about the need for um, more housing of particular types. I think, you know, we all, all providers of all across the whole spectrum from um, homeownerships, home ownership through purpose-built rental uh, of the sort that we do, through to um, affordable and, and council housing. Everything is needed in more uh, quantity than is being provided or has been provided over recent years. And we all need to be doing as much as we possibly can. And that does that shouldn't stop. 
um, for more than uh, for longer than than necessary. Um, uh, and you know, we we if we've got to have a chance of of uh, addressing this properly. Um, you know, bear in mind that you know development is a very long term process. It's it's uh, you know finding sites is just the the, the start of the process. You, you know design the planning process, the construction program is is a multi year process, even for the simplest of sites. So uh, we really need to to keep that momentum uh, going. Well, it's good to um to to end on a on an optimistic note. Um, I guess I mean it, it seems really facile um to me. Uh, I'm afraid to to be dealing with questions of such magnitude and and you know these are life and death situations in some cases we've been talking about today in in just an hour conversation like this. And and I sort of apologise for for the superficial nature that that any conversation like this has to, has to have. But at the same time, I hope that um that you on the panel um have have managed to get a good idea of. Um, of what Do Some Good can offer and, and uh, created some links there that you can make use of in the future. I hope that the audience has learned something um, about that campaign and can engage with it also, and um, also got a, a little bit of insight into, into the work of, of local authorities during, during this period. Um, I'd urge everyone um, taking part to go and have a look at www.do-some-good.co.uk uh, to take part in, in the campaign. Um, I'd like to take an opportunity now to uh, thank our speakers for taking part, especially uh, Councillor Rob Well for, uh, for getting out of his sickbed uh, for, for an hour for us this morning. It's much appreciated. Uh, I'm going to do a little clap. I'm assuming everyone's clapping at home um, and you've got your, your virtual applause, um, Peter, uh, Steve, Darren and James. And to the audience, thank you very much indeed for uh, all the questions. We've had lots and lots of questions. It's been really, really helpful. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but I hope we've answered uh, enough to, to satisfy uh, an hour's worth of your time. Um, and to remind you that we will be focusing on some of these issues, particularly on planning and development uh, next week's webinar at 11 a.m. and invite you to, to register for that. Um, the invites will be sent out shortly. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, the Voice of Authority uh, website is carrying daily interviews with local authorities, with top people at councils uh, now on their work and how it's being affected by coronavirus and the implications for development and growth um, over, over the short and long term. Uh, and I look forward to all seeing you all, I hope, uh, next week at 11 a.m. But thank you very much indeed for taking part. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.